Uh, we have to talk a little bit about multi-threading. And one of the s other small lies I told you last year is a computer can do a lot of things at once. So if I was to walk over to that computer right now and look, and it, you see it's got like it's checking for email, it's running the antivirus, it's running this uh, web connection to display this page. And you're like, boy, this thing is really good at doing stuff simultaneously. Now, the fact that it looks like it's working simultaneously is actually an illusion that's created by the fact that you live in a world of seconds because you're a human and that machine lives in the world of microseconds. So the machine sees time in little blocks that are about one millionth the size of the blocks that you see the world. So let me start off today by talking a little bit about this multi-threading thing and why it looks like magic but what's really happening under the machine. Inside that machine, there is one CPU. It may have multiple cores, but most of the time only one core is active. And what's happening here is even though it looks to you like there's several things going on at the same time, that is not really what's happening. What's happening is that the operating system, in my case Windows, on your machine it might be a Mac, it doesn't matter. What it's done is it's taken these processes that are running and it's arranged them into this sort of circle like this, right? And we call this structure a circular queue. And we'll learn more about circular queues later in the year when we talk about queues. You can think of a queue as like a bank line, but in this case, it's circular. So when you get to the end, you start at the beginning again. In fact, a circular queue like this doesn't really have a beginning and end. You can start anywhere. They're all pretty much equivalent to starting at the first block. Every block is like the first block. So what happens is this particular process might be, might be maybe I'm running Microsoft Word, and this might be the antivirus. Maybe this is like the Norton antivirus. And maybe this one is the, the web browser that I have open. And there might be like several other applications or processes that are running. Here's what the CPU does, what the operating system does. It decides there's a piece of software in the operating system called the scheduler. And what the scheduler does, it decides, OK, I'm going to run the antivirus now for a few milliseconds, let it do its thing. And so it takes this uh, process, brings it into memory, runs it for a while, lets it do its thing. It's like, come on, hurry up. OK, you've had your 20 milliseconds, whatever. Puts it back to sleep, which is to say it takes it out of the RAM, puts it back in the flash, says, OK, you're done for a while now. Then goes on to the next one, takes this, brings it into the memory, runs it for a while. Mr. Amrani, sir, I would really appreciate it if you could pay attention and not play on your computer while I'm teaching. Yes? Pull it into the RAM or into the cache on the CPU? It'll push, pu pull it into the cache. The cache is RAM. Caches are built out of RAM. It's the super fast RAM. It'll pull it into the cache, which is RAM. It'll run it for a while, put it to sleep, go to the next one, and go around and around forever. That's all it does. As long as the computer's running, it goes around this circular queue and just keeps running the different processes. Now, let's look at this particular process. Let's say that you have Microsoft Word running on your machine. When it pulls this process in, the process itself has several threads or tasks going on inside of it. And you might be wondering, why would one process, one, one process like these need multiple threads? Here, let me explain to you. So let's say you have Microsoft Word running, right? Now, one thing that the Word is doing is, have you noticed that while you're typing, it checks your spelling? You've seen that, right? So that could be one thread. Another thread might be that it periodically takes what you're writing and writes it to the disk to save it. You've seen that, right? Autosave, all that. That might be another thread. Another thread might be counting the number of words and paragraphs and everything. And that might be another thread. So not only is it taking these processes and taking them in and out of memory, but within a process, it might be taking several tasks taking and putting them in and out of memory also. Now, the weird thing about this is you notice that it only does one thing at a time, puts it to sleep, does another thing. But because it's doing it in millionths of a second, and because you live in seconds, to you, you look at this, oh, it's all going on at the same time. But that's not what's really happening. You see the difference? OK. So that is a basic concept of multi-threading. And I promise to talk much more about this later when we 
discuss how we can do multi-threading. And I think the later part of the year, we actually run some multi-threads and show you how to get several threads going at the same time. Yes, Ben. So for some software that uses like multi-core rendering, do they have two different executables running on each core? They just yes, together? yes, that's exactly what they have. And we'll actually do one or two exercises like that right at the end of the year. Well, we'll, we'll use the multiple cores in the machine and show you how to run things in parallel. Very powerful, rarely ever used because it's so complicated, but we will, that, I think that's like the next to last project in the course or something like that. Now, why do I mention all this stuff about multi-threading? It has something to do with this immutability thing, and that's what I want to talk about next. So I want you to imagine, first of all, um, let's do a brief little review of immutability. Uh, at this point, I'm going to ask you if you have a computer with you. Uh, who doesn't have a computer with them? Everyone have one? Okay, terrific. Power up your IntelliJ, and let's look at some brief review of string immutability. So I'm going to ask you to start a project on, Blue J on uh, in in IntelliJ. We'll call it immutability or something like that. And what I want you to do is create a public static void main. And in there, we're going to create some string variables. And we're going to see if we can remember everything we learned during CSA. And it will help sort of jog the memory and bring you back to where you were by the time you had left my class last year. So if I do this, if I go string s equals a, b, c, and then I go s dot to upper case. Now, before you actually type this into the machine, and then I go system out print s, what's it going to print? Is it going to print the lower case or the upper case? Before you do it on the computer, talk to your neighbor about this and decide what's going to print. Is it going to print the upper case or the lower case? I just should I put it over here. s dot to upper case, like that. And who remembers what's it going to print? Is it going to print the uppercase or the lowercase? Let's see here. Uh, Mr. Adil, sir, can you tell me, is it going to print the upper or lowercase? Uh, Try it now. Mr. Mulcahy, can you tell me why it'll print the lowercase? Look, I converted it to uppercase here, and still when I print it, it prints the lowercase. This is why. Because strings are immutable. They can't be changed. So if I did want to permanently change it so that it becomes uppercase, what do I need to do? Yes, Ms. Mila? I forgot to do this. Now, let's look at what's happening in the memory. I'm trying to make you remind you of everything you already should have learned in CSA. So let's say I don't do this, right? Let's say I go like this. Here's what happens. First, you create a string called ABC in memory. So here's ABC, right? It's in memory, and S is pointing to it like that. And then you say, OK, I'd like to convert it to uppercase, please. Now, the compiler knows, and the Java virtual machine knows that that's immutable. You can't go there and change it. That's what immutable means. So what does it do? It says, oh, you want to convert it to uppercase? OK, I'll go to some other new memory location. Yes, miss? Is IntelliJ, I'm pretty sure if you do that line without S equals, it will say that the statement doesn't change anything. Wow. Really? Yeah. That's a new thing. I've never seen that before. Wow, that's really impressive. That makes a lot of sense. They just keep making it better every year. So what it'll do is it will create this new string ABC, and it'll go like that. Notice that S is still pointing to the old ABC, so that when you come down here to print it, you're still going to print this one. But if you do this, what happens is it creates this one. But now, because of this s equals, what happens is it comes by, and it takes this pointer, and it now switches it over here. Notice that the original string is still immutable. I didn't change it. I made a brand new one. See that, right? So now, when I print it, now it's going to print the uppercase one. So this is a requirement. If I want to update the memory for s, I need to change where it's pointing to. And this helps me overcome the immutability of the string. OK? So that is what it means to be immutable. 
Now, no one has ever asked me this in CSA, but don't you think it's kind of weird that they built it like that? I mean, wouldn't it be so much easier to just go in here and just change the memory and just put the new thing over here? That would be so much easier, right? What is one of the, one of the main advantages of immutability? That's what I want to discuss today. Why would you want to make something immutable? Because it turns out it has one big advantage and also has one big disadvantage. And that's what I want to talk about today. And that'll help set the stage for why we need this string builder. OK. <clears throat> we're going to go back to that multi-threading thing that we were talking about. And I want you to imagine that there are two processes. This one over here, which I will call process A. And there's another process over here, which I'll call process B. And for the sake of argument, we'll just say that these are the only two processes that are running on the computer right now. That's, that would be pretty unusual. Usually the thing has like 50 processes going. But let's just say for the sake of argument, these are the only two processes that are running. So what's the scheduler doing? It takes this one, brings it into memory, lets it run for a while, says, OK, you've had your turn, puts it back to sleep, takes this one, brings it into the cache, runs it for a while, puts it back to sleep, and just keeps going back and forth between the two. I want you to imagine also that these two processes share a piece of data that's in the RAM. So here's the RAM, and there's some data in here that this process reads and writes, and this process needs the same piece of information. Can you think of the risk now that there might be? What, what could go wrong here? Discuss with your partner what could go wrong in this scenario. I, can't, I don't understand what you're asking me. Wouldn't what be applicable? Yes, yes. So I did not say that there's a string here. In fact, I didn't say what kind of data it was. Let's just say that it's some integer or something like that. I don't know, something that's in the memory. It's not a string. Let's say it's something else. Okay, let's say it's an integer. It basically is tracking something or other. I don't know. Can anyone think of the danger about these two processes touching the same piece of data? Anyone want to take a whack at it? Okay, Ms. Mila, what do you think? So you just can't, for example, if A has a certain code, what you can, for example, like let's take ABC and you need to be like, well, let's take ABC. If you change the name to opposite ABC and the code is the same, or that could happen. Um, I'm going to explain to you now why that can't happen with strings, but you're sort of on the right track. Yes, Ben? Like one of the programs is using some shared integer as an index, and then one pro the other program changes it, so it becomes invalid in the first one. OK, those things are, are valid. That basically means that code hasn't been written correctly. Let me, uh, let me I think I've maybe asked you a question that you're not really prepared for, so let me help you. Let's say that this process wants to update this memory, right? Let's say that it's done writing part of it, but not run, done writing the rest of it. And then the operating system comes along and says, time for you to go to sleep. You're like, no way. I'm in the middle of writing this thing. The operating system's like, yeah, I don't really care. You're done. So it puts it to sleep. So now this thing has got some garbagey stuff in it. You see what I'm getting at, right? And then this thing comes along. Oh, yeah, time for me to use that RAM. Goes in here, and there's garbage in there. You can see how that could happen, right? Especially if this is like some complicated thing with like multiple bytes and it wrote some of them and didn't write the other ones. Because the operating system, when it puts you to sleep, it literally like puts a gun to your head. It's like, yeah, you're going to sleep now. It's like, but, but I can't. It's, no, you're going to sleep now. So it just puts you to sleep. So basically, there's a danger here of this thing having like half written this thing, and then it goes to sleep, and then this thing comes in, and it's all messed up. So we don't want that. Now, it turns out that there are two go good ways to avoid that scenario. One way is to use something called a semaphore. And what a semaphore is, is it's a flag. And what the process does, it establishes a semaphore for this data. And when it wants to write to this data, it checks the semaphore, sees that it's clear, says, OK, I'm going to set that semaphore. And when that semaphore gets set, no one else is allowed to touch this data but me. OK, once it grabs the semaphore, then it starts changing the data. And if it gets put to sleep halfway in the middle, that's OK. Because when this process comes around, what does it do first before it touches that data? 
checks the semaphore, says, oh, someone else is using that data. I can't mess with that. You know what? I'll just wait until my turn comes around again. And then eventually this thing will get put back to sleep. This thing will come back awake again. It'll finish writing the data. It'll clear the semaphore. And then when this thing wakes up, it'll be like, oh, the semaphore is clear now. I can touch that data. Now, the semaphore business, we're going to talk about that later in the course. It turns out that there's one other thing that can avoid this issue very cleanly and easily. No gimmicks or gadgets, very, very simply. Can anyone guess what property of this data will cause it never to have an issue? Try and discuss this with your partner now. Mr. Basu, sir, can you tell me what property of this data would, 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 would result in no, no issue ever about this, uh, this contingency that we're discussing here? Can you guess? There's something that we've discussed before that would solve this problem. Instead of having to use this fancy semaphore thing, there's something else that could solve it. Any idea? Not really. Mr. Ajoji? Uh, yes. It doesn't just have to be strings. Don't think that strings are the only immutable data type. There are lots of data types in Java that are immutable. We're going to learn about a bunch of them this year. But if the data is immutable, you never have to worry about one of the processes having changed it partly. Why? It can't be changed. See that? So if the first one, let's say that this process data had written this ABC over here. Right? And let's say that this other data over here, that this, this thing also had a pointer to it. And then this thing wants to change it right, to DEF. Well, it's going to write DEF over here. It's going to change this pointer over here. But guess what? This thing here is still got its own pointer. And this data is never changing. Why isn't it changing? Because it's immutable. Okay. So having immutability makes it really easy to avoid any issues with multiple ta tasks or processes hitting the data at the same time. So that is the big, big advantage of immutability. Okay, You can live in a multi-threaded environment and not worry that one task is corrupting your data and the other task is going to pick up that corrupted data. So that's one big advantage. It turns out, though, that this immutability has a huge disadvantage. And that is the reason we're going to need this string builder. And I'm going to talk to you about that disadvantage now. <clears throat> so I mentioned to you that that computer right now is running multiple processes. And if I was running a Java program, that Java program itself would have multiple tasks associated with it. And one of the tasks that would be running, so let's say you wrote this program here. right? So you wrote this program. And you compiled it, and you're running. So the operating system has taken your process here, this program. It's brought it into the memory, and it's running. And as I mentioned, the, pr the program itself has several tasks associated with it, right? And one of those tasks is going to be this piece of software that's running, which you don't even know about, called the garbage collector. And the garbage collector works like this. Your, your, your program is running, and after a while, the operating system says, uh, you've had enough time. You go to sleep, let the garbage collector run, and then the garbage collector runs. And here's what happens. Let's say the garbage collector comes along and sees this. Okay, And there are these variables that are pointing over here. And there's nothing pointing over here in your program. The, the garbage collector can look at this table and see that there are these strings, and these are the variables that are pointing here. Question, what do you think happened here? How come there's no variable pointing to it? What happened here? Yes, sir? Variable got reassigned, just like we were doing in that little program I showed you, where s equals 2 uppercase, or in this case, maybe they added a letter or something. So because of the immutability, it started off here, but then got changed to this, or maybe this one. We don't really know. Okay? And you can see that this string now doesn't have a pointer to it. Question, if I have a string and there's nothing pointing to it, 
can my program ever access this piece of data again? It's floating in the ocean. Nothing's pointing to it. Can't use it anymore. So what does the garbage collector do? It collects the garbage. And it brings this memory location back into the usable pool of memory so that your program or some other program can reuse that location okay, for some future thing that you want to do. Okay? So the garbage collector is basically undoing the damage of your program. Yes, sir? It just marks it. It would take too long to overwrite it. There's no point in it. It just has a table saying basically that this location is now free and usable. Okay? So the garbage collector basically is coming along and reclaiming this so that now the only pieces of data that are actually being used are what's being consumed in the memory. I realize that this is big and complicated. So now here's the problem. Let's say that you were writing a for loop and let's say you were doing something I don't know either forever or maybe like a million times and inside this for loop that you're doing like a million times what you're doing is you're taking some string right and you're simply adding another character to it you see that right so you're taking the string you're adding a character and you're rewriting it now imagine what's happening in memory you're taking the string, you're adding a character, you're rewriting the string. Is it going to go back to the same memory location and change the string? No. No. Why not? Because it's, it's immutable. So how much work are you making for the garbage collector? Massive amounts of work for the garbage collector. Hopefully the garbage collector will run in enough time to come and clean up your garbage, your mess, so that the entire memory system doesn't collapse. But if you're creating garbage at a rate faster than the garbage collector can collect it, what's going to happen to your program? Yes, sir? You're going to get memory leak, and what's eventually going to happen? Your program's going to crash, and the operating system is going to say, you used up all the memory. Now, even if that doesn't happen, even if the garbage collector is able to clean up after you fast enough, what do you think will be the impact on the user using that machine? Well, how will they experience what's happening? Yes. The computer, the performance of the computer will dramatically decline and it'll start to lag and slow down. You're like, what's wrong with this thing? Why isn't it working? So you can see that when you have certain applications where you're generating lots and lots of strings that are slightly different from old strings, it's not a good idea to use an immutable string. It's just not a good idea. What you want is a string that's mutable. You want a string where if you create it like this, right, and you want to change it, you want to be able to go in here and actually go into where the ABC is located and add the D here or the E or whatever and save it there and use the exact same memory locations. Yes, miss? Miss, I don't know Python, so I don't really know the answer to your question. Okay? So this is what we want. We want to be able to change the memory location where the string is loaded. So we want a mutable string. And that is what String Builder is. What is the disadvantage of String Builder? Yes, sir. The strings are now mutable. And therefore, uh, it's susceptible to change from if you have multiple tasks accessing the same data, not a good thing to use the string builder. What should you use instead? The old strings that you learned before. Yes, sir. So how is this same issue avoided with other data types that aren't immutable by default? So believe it or not, in Java, most important data types that are provided by the libraries have two versions a mutable one and an immutable one. So uh, let me change that. Uh, they have two versions. One is called thread safe and the other one is called uh, not thread safe. And so basically there's one version that's super complicated where it either has, either has immutability or it has that semaphore thing I showed you to protect itself. 
And the other version is just the plain old version where you can't really use it in a multi-threaded environment. So for example, this thing that you learned last year called ArrayList, that is not thread safe. If you try to access the same ArrayList from two different tasks, you could run into trouble. But there's a version of this that is thread safe. Does anybody know what that's called in Java? It's called vector. We haven't learned that yet, but that's these two things are identical, except that this one is not thread safe and this one is thread safe. 